Okay, so we're in class 19, and as promised, we're going to take a, a tour of fluid kinematics and then some and into the scary world of potential flow. Well, in kinematics, remember, is the description of motion. So we, if we want to describe uh, how these, uh, how a fluid element is moving, how it's motion, we could break it down into four different types of motion. Translation, skipping to the end, and rotation. But then also the fluid element might change uh, a shape and uh, size. So we might have linear deformation. We might have angular deformation. So let's just kind of look and do a little tour of these various things. So translation we've already kind of covered in the kinematics that we previously did where we have velocity and acceleration and it is moving. Uh, for linear def uh, deformation, that's uh, kind of a little bit like more like um, what we do in mechanics materials, right? Where we can crush something or or at least smush it into another shape. Um, as long as it remains the same like volume, we're going to be okay in terms of our compressibility or incompressibility. But of course, we might be dealing with gases which are compressible, so we might need to incorporate some linear deformation in trying to describe. How, what is happening to the, uh, to, to the fluid uh, elements. Um, in the angular deformation, okay, so it might, uh, it, it can rotate um, and, or it can actually get skewed, right? And the skew, we really kind of kind of associate with shearing. It's going to happen when things shear. It's going to have this uh, shear deformation, if you might recall that from mechanics materials as well. Um, and it's a lot of this in understanding it is about the slope that's taking place and um, even that slope can be used to try to find what the rotation is so you could this is one of our definitions right up here of rotation is based on dv dx and du dy and that's where it comes from right from this deformation of this element and we can even look at an angular deformation rate and which is related to viscosity um, and if the, you could note, notably, if these two, uh, are, if one is the negative of the other, the deformation becomes uh, rotation, right? And that rotation can also be described with the curl. Um, the, the rotation is one half the curl of V. And um, so, so based on that idea of curl, we define this thing called vorticity, which is actually two times the, uh, 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 the, the rotation, angular rotational speed. And if that vorticity equation is equal to zero, we dub that irrotational. All right, so I say 20 minutes to explain. I'm going to try to do it in less. Uh, the streamlining function and the velocity potential function, these are two ways. This is th These are ways that uh, engineers and scientists tried to go about uh, creating equations to describe flow. And so they came up with these, these building blocks that they could put together. Now, we've already seen previously in, I think, like class six, where we had this, um, well, that's the continuity equation, excuse me. Um, what we get, based on that, um, is that based on that? No, not necessarily. No, no, that's just extra information. Really based on this thing on the right-hand side, we can kind of see that we, if we want to take like the slope of a, um, of, of a velocity vector, right? That we can use this new function that we're defining, use that as the definition, right? Of if we had a function and we took the derivative of it with respect to y, we would get the u velocity. If we took the derivative of this function, we'd get the negative uh, uh, of the velocity in, in the y direction, right? So there, it, it's just an invented function that has this behavior. And then you work backwards to start describing what the function is, right? So it's, it, hopefully that's, that, that becomes clear. It's an invented function. And its whole purpose is to, like, be, to serve as this uh, magical thing that's able to describe uh, um, uh, velocities. And um, recall this thing that we did below right here. This guy right here, when we were able to, uh, we, we use that. And, and to solve for streamlines, right? So when we wanted to draw, draw a streamline, we, we took this relationship for the velocity field, 
and we solved it and we came up with equations for our streamlines. Well, that's what the streamline function is, right? The streamlining function describes the flow, right? And we're working, we're purposely working backwards uh, with that. So we use class six to create streamlines using this relationship, which in effect, we're finding this uh, uh, streamline function. Um, and one of the important usefulnesses of this is that we can actually find the flow rate um, with is the width out of, out of plane, um, on a unit width out of plane, excuse me, between the streamlines, actually we can find, you know, their values, the values that we set them equal to can be used to calculate the, uh, um, the flow rate between the streamlines. Kind of interesting that way. Um, velocity potential is harder to understand because it's really sort of like it's a second cousin, but its main feature is that it's perpendicular to the streamline function. That's this main feature as we see up here in this uh, cartoon right here, that all these potential lines of potential are all perpendicular right in there. Um, so one of the aspects of these things is if you take uh, um, the, the, as they're related, we get this Laplacian uh, operator uh, that can happen to both of these and the necessary condition for this to happen is that we have irrotationality, right? So it has to be irrotational and so, um, several other aspects, we have to have inviscid, incompressible, and irritational. And we have all three of those things, we're allowed to use these functions together to what is often referred to as potential flow. And the purpose of this potential flow lines is uh, to keep the streamlines uh, correctly aligned, right? And, um, and make sure that we have the irritational uh, assumption. Now that irritational assumption, you can think of that because the potential lines have to be perpendicular to the streamlines that that requires that necessitates that we have irritational uh, flow um, and this can be determined uh, by the it can be determined by the velocity at all points can be determined if if you can determine these things you can determine the velocity at all po uh, all points and uh, because we are in the condition of inviscid incompressible and irritational we can now use Bernoulli so it is, there's a, there's a lot of motivation for this um, especially since we might have certain flow conditions that are hard to create equations for, but now we can kind of create them using these basic building blocks. Um, notably, for the streamlines, uh, as they get closer and closer together, that means they accelerate. And as they get further apart, they de the flow is decelerating. So you can kind of think about that also graphically as being one of the things that you can uh, try to, to figure out. You can find the acceleration based on how these streamlines are working together when you build them together using these building blocks and the superposition. So here are the building blocks. The first one is uniform flow. Um, just kind of makes sense where you're gonna have a flow that's just straight and uh, um, going along. It might even be at a diagonal, which is what we're showing here in terms of the uh, uh, trying to get the coordinates going on. So we just have capital U being the uh, far field velocity, and we could just take this. Um, and so that's a building block. One in very important building block, it's actually two building blocks in one, is a sink, source and a sink. And this is a conceptual thing, um, but you're looking down on it, so it's only two dimensional. Uh, but if you were to, to look down upon this water fountain, that would be a source, right? And then if you were going to look down upon the sink, it would be a sink, right? The bathroom sink. And we, do, we don't know where the water is coming from. It isn't, it isn't exactly like that. These are actually streamlines and uh, potential lines. Uh, and we can use these together when we combine them with other things. And we'll see examples of that in a second. We can have a vortex, right? So a vortex is just... Uh, you know, like a little whirlpool thing going around here. Um, but it's not going in and out of anything. It's just spinning for some reason. And but we can have uh, equations describing that motion in both the streamline function and the velocity potential function. Um, and remember, though, that this, even though it's spinning, it can still be irrotational. And that's just like the, you could think of that as the merry-go-round, not merry-go-round, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Mr. Ferris. Ferris was an engineer, by the way. Ferris was a remarkable engineer that in the 
World's Fair, Chicago World's Fair, he, he's the one that came up with the idea to have this amazingly huge Ferris wheel that was a big hit of that World's Fair. And he's an engineer, I think he lives in, from Pennsylvania, uh, that, that came up, proposed the idea. The, 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 the cars on the, his Ferris wheel he made were about the size of like a, almost a train car. That's how big that thing was. But anyway, sorry, I digressed. But you could see that the, the, the passengers inside the, the, the cars here, they never spin so that they still, even though they're rotating around, they still are, obey irritationality. And uh, um, we can call it irritational. Um, so, okay, so when you combine a source and a sink nearby each other, you get a doublet. And you can move, and this is very weirdly conceptual, you can get a doublet by making the source and the sink get closer and closer and closer together. And it's really hard to conceive that that can happen, but it can. And so here's one, here's one of our first combos where we take a, a uniform and add it with a source. And we can make what's called a half body here. And you can start to see that the streamlines that we've created right there. Well, first off, notably, you have a stagnation point, right? Because so the velocity, that's the location with the velocity coming out of the source equals the velocity of the uniform flow. So that makes sense. It's a stagnation point, just like you get a stagnation point right here on the flow of this. What looks like it'd be a tennis ball, right? And they call this a half body. And it's funny because I made a half mannequin right there. Um, and now you, what you could do also, you could take a source and a sink and a uniform flow, and you can make what's called a ranking oval. And that looks a lot like a submarine, doesn't it? So we could try to get the, what to describe or, or maybe it's the ship and we're looking down at the, at the waterline. Although it's not a great representation, but we now have an equation. We now have an equation for a streamline. Um, and then we can also, this is the really crazy one with the uniform and the doublet. You can make what looks like the, like the flow, very steady, even flow that's happening around a, a sphere or a cylinder. And uh, that's cool. And then and have another one, we could have a vortex. We could add a vortex uh, to a uniform flow. And now we have, we could start to quantify the Magnus effect where we have like uh, the backspin of a ball or a, uh, uh, or a tennis ball or, or do the curve ball or a, a golf ball in flight or dropping uh, balls off of a dam, like I've seen on the videos of the dudes that drop the balls off the dam. That's really cool. We can see the Magnus effect onto the thing. All right, so now the, the next thing we're gonna do on the next is we're gonna go and do um, use, uh, actually use, um, uh, uh, Navier-Stokes, right? To try to show some classic usages of Navier-Stokes in the few, um, uh, the, 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 the few, uh, solvable versions of Navier-Stokes that are possible. Uh, so you can kind of see what the result would be if you could solve the Navier-Stokes. Um, so that is the end of the video. And by the way, I should point out that I did not know, understand this stuff at all when I was an undergraduate. And we had a quiz on this in Fluid Mechanics 2. And uh, I made a zero on that quiz. So that's full disclosure. On the bright note, that's the, the next, the next very next class, which in the, in the room very next door was the midterm for heat transfer. And uh, I broke the curve and aced it. And everybody was mad that somebody had done that. And I never revealed to anyone until this very moment, at least not to my Kings Point brethren. I'm sorry, class of 92. Uh, I was the one that broke the uh, heat transfer curve and Smoke and Joe Janone's uh, class. So... Thank you, and I hope none of you uh, will uh, rat me out. Thank you.